Paul. So we are going to continue this morning in our study of, of 2 Corinthians, which flows right out of 1 Corinthians. And um, these two books really are very foundational to, to what a church is. Of course, as you know, we're, we're about a year and a half into this thing that we call Coram Deo Bible Church. And along the way, and, and as, we've, as we've moved on, I have come to, to recognize and see and fully believe that and said many times that this is the healthiest, most unified church I've ever been a part of and what a joy it is. And one of the things that we must do is have a radical commitment to, to maintaining that, to, to keeping that being the reality. I remember uh, when I sat down before any of this started and started kind of thinking about, okay, uh, what exactly is it that makes up a healthy church? What is a church to be? And what would that look like in a practical way? Uh, of course, as a pastor, that's something that is constantly on my mind, right? You know, and you've, you've heard me say it many times, and I'll say it many more times because I want it to be cemented into your head and into your heart, the three biblical purposes of the church, the exaltation of God, the edification of the body, and the evangelism of the lost. That, that's what the Bible tells us a church is to be. And of course, I've preached many sermons on those three things, and so we need to know those and, and keep them in our minds. They need to be in the front of our minds, not just something that we hear and file away and put on the back burner. Um, and while no church is perfect, no church ever will be this side of heaven, remember, perfect is not the goal. I mean, we would like to, to be moving in that direction, certainly, uh, but perfect is not the goal. Uh, another thing that is very easy to get distracted by is, is growth, right? We've just moved into this beautiful new space that allows us a lot more room, uh, a lot of growth, and we hope for that to happen. But numerical growth is not the goal either. And I hope the Lord continues to bless us and brings more people here. Uh, but the real goal is that the people that the Lord brings here are growing spiritually, you know, whether it's a hundred of us or four hundred of us, it, it's going to be the Lord's plan and the Lord's work that, that brings here. And, and our goal, again, our goal is not to be the biggest church, although we hope to grow. Our goal is not to be a perfect church, although we do hope that Philippians 1 6 describes us, right? He who began a good work in you will perfect it, will bring it to perfection until the day of Christ Jesus. So, so we certainly hope for that, that ongoing uh, growth. Our goal isn't even to be the most exciting church in town, although we do hope that people are excited to come and be here and excited about what we're doing. Our goal is to be a faithful church, faithful to God's word. And that's what those five commitments that we've talked about many times, they're on, on that back table. They're on the side of that. They're on our little inviter cards. They're on our website. They're central to everything. It starts with a high view of God. Meaning we have to be faithful to exalt God in every area of our life. And as a church, that primarily begins with what we do on Sunday morning. It's our worship service. It's what we include in our worship service. It's what we do. It's the elements. It's how we do that, culminating in the preaching of God's Word. That, that is a high view of God and a high view of Scripture. Those are the first two things, right? It's easy to affirm, yes, I have a high view of Scripture. Yes, I agree with inerrancy. But it doesn't take long to realize that some people, even though they affirm that, really don't believe it. Uh, being faithful to God's Word is, is a very important thing. Obedience is, is central. So if you have a high view of God and a high view of His Word, that does mean something. Uh, we also talk about faithful discipleship, which is most easily summarized as helping one another follow Jesus better. And, and we kind of have to pause there and, and ask a question, what are you doing like right, not right this very moment, but what are you doing right now in the ebb and flow of your life that is going to help other people in our church follow Jesus better? Something we always need to be doing and thinking about and, and be committed to. That's the edification of the body. It's equipping. It's, it's encouragement. It's building one another up. It, it's stimulating one another to love and good deeds. It's growing in the full knowledge and all discernment and approving things that are excellent, being sincere and without fault. And when we talk about discipleship, it's something that is both personal and corporate. It's not something you do alone, although it is something that you must personally be committed to. And we're very simple in our approach to what it is. The together portion is what happens on Wednesday nights, every other Wednesday when we, when we have our discipleship. So it's very simple in our pursuit of that. The fourth commitment that we have, of course, is gospel centrality. We understand the mandate of evangelism. Uh, it's essential, it's a command, it's an obligation, but it's also a joy. 
It's really actually very fun when you actually get into it and, and share the gospel with people. It's something that you should be thinking about regularly, uh, strategizing. It's, it's one of the things that you can rightly obsess about is how can I do a band? You can be obsessed with that, and that's a good thing. Most things that we obsess over are, are not good things, but this is something you can obsess over. And the gospel has to be central to everything we do. It's the foundational message. It's the, it's the central theme of the Bible. Uh, it's the most essential thing you can know, understand, and believe is, is the gospel. And when the gospel is central, that has implications. You're going you're gonna to hear it weekly. You're going to hear it all the time. Uh, you're going to want to talk about it. You're going to want to share it. it ha- and, and it forces us and leads us to have an outward focus, right? Acts 1.8 makes that very simple. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And then the final one, and, and this is the last one, it's, it's the one that if you have ever talked to me, you know I love to talk about this, is joy and community. And that's the fifth one. And that's really what we're talking about today. That's, that's what today's passage is really about. Uh, and, and I know that you know this, but Peter, in his second letter, he wrote, he said, I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, meaning as long as he is alive, to stir you up by way of reminder. And so we need reminders. We need constantly to be re-inspired toward the things the Bible tells us to do. We need to be regularly brought back to, to our central purposes. So if you haven't opened your Bibles, I would invite you to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, last week we skipped over a few verses in, in our study of chapter 6. Uh, we're going to come back to those verses. So we're going to begin in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at verses 11 through 13 in chapter 6. And then we're going to jump down to chapter 7, verse 2. It's all on the same page or very close to the same page. Uh, And that's what we're going to do. So flowing out of that, and and remember that much of what Paul is writing about here in this chapter is he's defending himself against these false teachers, the false accusations that had come in. These people that had come into the church were probably in positions of leadership, but were certainly exercising significant negative influence on the congregation. Um, And Paul was defending himself not for the sake of himself, but for the sake of the people in this church that he deeply loved. And so these verses today, which really kind of are a sandwich with that section that we looked at last week about do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, they're interwoven. So this morning we're looking at Paul's description of his commitment to and his affection for the brothers and sisters in the church so that we can see what a commitment to being a part of a community of believers looks like in a practical way, and so that we can follow that behavior that Paul has given us. Now, and there's a spoiler alert. This is a list of to-dos. So we're going to be given a list of 10 things to do this morning. Um, So even as we kind of consider this, remember that, and we talked about this a lot when we were in 1 Corinthians, that what is really going on and one of our goals as we, as we read through and study these passages is to look at the underlying theology that is there that Paul is building these admonitions on. So I'd invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 11 and we'll read three verses and then we'll jump down to chapter 7 and verse 2. This is the Word of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 11. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is opened wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. Now, in a like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. Chapter 7, verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you, For I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I have been filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this passage and for these instructions. We thank you for this church and for what you have been and are doing in and through us. And we pray that you would continue that work that we would continue to love one another and to love you. And we thank you for what you're saying to us today. Change us, bring a greater conviction to pursue you and to pursue your truth as a result of our time in your word this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
So Paul, really what he's doing in this passage this morning, he's telling us how he feels about them. And this is interesting because he is telling these people who had followed the lead of false teachers, at least some of them, and at least for a time, and, and he's, they followed this, this aberrant way. And, and in this portion of his defense, and that, it comes up again and again in this, in this particular letter, but in this portion he's really reminding them in the midst of this of his deep abiding affection for them. There's this outpouring of desire that he has for a, a commitment to a deep, loving community. And as, as we pursue joy in community as a church, there's foundational things in here. And really, the things that we're going to see in this passage, they're, they're kind of non-negotiables, right? If we're to continue to be a church that is experiencing joy in community, these are ten things that we must be purposeful and intentional to pursue. And, and like Brent pointed out in, 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 chapter of, in the second chapter of Acts, it's the Holy Spirit that enables this. So outside of the active, intentional work of the Holy Spirit in and through the Word of God, these things won't happen. So again, there, there's, there's, that's, that's, that's built into this. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we had this beautiful picture of what the body of Christ is and uh, how that all kind of works together. It said the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body. The summary of that being you need the body and the body needs you. Today's passage kind of picks up where 1 Corinthians 12 left off and telling us what it is. But here in this passage, we're seeing how you are to pursue that, how we are to interact with one another in light of what we saw in 1 Corinthians 12 and in pursuit of what we saw in Corinthians 12. It begins in verse 11, and it opens up with Paul giving them basically an admonition of honesty. That's the first principle we see. That's the first thing. Verse 11 is honesty. There's a full openness here from Paul. He's not holding back anything. He's not hedging. He's not trying to soften the blow because he loves them. And what causes this honesty is his love. That's the foundation of it. He's going to be honest with them about God, about God's word, about God's truth, about God's standards. He's not going to pull any punches because when you're communicating the truth of who God is, you can't pull any punches. You can't just talk only about God's love and never talk about God's wrath, for example. That's an easy, that's an easy way to pull a punch. Like, oh, we all we ever do is talk about God is love, God is love, God is love, God is love. Well, God is also wrath. That's, that's true. He's also going to be very honest with them, and he's, he's, he's got to be honest with them about sin, because to allow someone to continue down a path of sin would not be loving. And because he loves them, he is going to lovingly tell them the truth about their sin, about the consequences of that, which begins, of course, with an explanation of our radical need for Christ. We can never forget that. We have to be honest with ourselves about our need for Christ. It never ebbs. It never goes away. It never diminishes. We have to be honest with one another about our need for Christ. We need to remind one another of how much we need Christ in an ongoing way. And we need to remind those outside of these walls about that. And think about this. This is something you can't forget. Your sin, your sin, your, the things that you have done are so bad that it literally took the death of the Son of God to resolve them. It's not a little white lie. It's not just a, a slight deviation from the optimal path. It's not, it's, it's, it's not just, I'm just a little off track right now. No, it's sin that required the death of, of Jesus to resolve. It's heinous, it's wicked, it's evil, and we want to do everything we can to try to diminish our own sin. Again, we've talked about this, so it goes all the way back to the garden. What did, what did Adam do when God came and said, hey, let's talk about your sin? He goes, no, 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 it wasn't me, it was her. Or you, just anything but me. And sin will destroy you, and it is sin that sends people to hell. So it's a significant thing. And to not be honest with someone, to not tell the truth about what sin is and what the consequences are, is absolutely unloving. We, we have to be honest, and we have to call people to repentance of their sin. Of course, it begins with salvation, but it doesn't end there, because the struggle with sin doesn't end when, when you're saved. And so it, the first question is, have you repented of your sin? You know, it is, repentance is a change of affection and a change of direction. It's a both and. One causes the other. And, and so, that, so Paul is, is absolutely honest about this. Our mouth has spoken 
freely to you, he says. And that's what he's talking about. I have been and will maintain being honest with you about these things. And then the, second, the third thing that he's really being honest about really leads us into the second point, which is what chapter 12 is about, is affection. This is Paul's affection. He says his heart is open wide. The, the word means it's enlarged. He has room for them in his heart, even after the sorrow and the difficulty and the angst that they have caused him. In spite of the, he speaks of the restraint, this holding back. The Corinthians, at least those that had been, been, been lured away by the false teachers, had sort of restrained their affection for him. They had kind of closed it in when they had believed the lies of the false teachers. And, and Paul is saying that I'm not doing that in return. Paul is saying, I have not, even in the midst of all this, I have not held back any of my love or affection for you. Reminding us and telling us that this principle is, is that we cannot ever lose our affection for one another. It starts with love, loving one another, and we talk about both, both phileo love, that brotherly love, and the agape love, that, that uh, being committed to the other person and their good love. But I'll tell you what, the kind of love that he's talking about that we need to not restrain is also like. You need to like one another too. Because let's be honest, it's really easy to say, I love them, and, and, and mostly mean it, but in the back of your head thinking, but I don't really like them. I don't want to be around them. I'm trying to avoid, say, oh, I see they're sitting over there. I'm not saying I don't like you because you're sitting over there. <laughs> but, but I'm going to sit over here because I love you, but I want to sit on the app. No, that, we can't do that. We can't be that way because that's the truth. And I'm not saying that every single person in here has to be your best friend that you have dinner with every Friday night and you have coffee with twice a week, but you really should like everyone in here. You really should enjoy spending time with each other. And there are certainly going to be some people that you're more drawn to, that you spend more time with. And that's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And you're going to be closer to some people. And that's actually a good thing. That's a normal thing. But let me say it with clarity. It's good. It's okay. Uh, and and, and it's, we want to enjoy spending time with others and specific other people. Yes, do that. But don't dislike other people. If you, if somebody, you need to work on that if that's the case. And actually, if you've ever thought, I really enjoy hanging out with, with Joe, well, spend time with Joe. Do it. Just don't do it because I don't like Fred, okay, if that makes sense. But that, that's that love and that, that affection that he has. Don't restrain it, which leads directly. And all of these just really build on each other. It's great. When we hit verse 13 and moving down into the very first part of, of chapter 7, verse 2, is fellowship. Where he says, now in a like exchange, there's this back and forth, I speak as to children... Open wide to us also. Make room for us in your hearts. He's just said, we're loving you. We're open to you. We haven't restrained against you. You need now to do the same thing for us. Because Paul loved the Corinthians, and he longed for them to love him too. And that's what love is, and that's what love does. They were his spiritual children, so he can speak to them as a father would speak to a child. And they needed to make room for Paul in, his, in their own hearts. And kind of what's going on here is he's pointing out that as long as these false teachers are occupying this place of affection in your heart, it's going to keep Paul pushed out. Their association with and, and, and any kind of commitment they had to these false teachers that was ongoing ultimately was sinful. And it was something they needed to repent of. That, that's, that's the reason this love section includes do not be unequally yoked. right? So verse 13 of chapter 6 and verse 2 of, of chapter 2 are both about fellowship and community. And right in the middle is, you need, there are some people you need to disconnect from. And we looked at that more intentionally last week. But there are people that you should not spend time with for a variety of reasons. But in here in this, what he's saying, one of the things he says about love, moving from affection into fellowship, is that love longs for a response. Paul had a legitimate, right desire for them to love him back. He loved them. He had poured into them. And they're turning away from him, which had happened because of the false teachers and because of their influence, was a deep, painful wound for him. And, and, and this tells us that we should love one another too, right? We shouldn't just be receiving the love that people pour out on us. We need to love them back. We need to respond. And the most obvious, blatant, really simplest way to do that is, is fellowship. And the word fellowship literally means an association involving close mutual relations and involvement, 
It's the idea of participation with one another. So, so we, we should do that. We should, we should love back when people are loving us. And what he's really saying, and the reason verses 14 through 7-1 are in there, is because we have to sever ties with false teachers and, and others that would sort of be in that category. There are people you should not spend time with, that you should not hang out with. Some of them are obvious, some of them are less so. And really what we have and what Paul's kind of laying out ultimately is that there's, we really have uh, two broad relational categories of all the people that you're in relationship with, everyone you interact with regularly, everyone that you, that you uh, interact with intentionally falls into one of two categories, or they should fall into one of two categories. There's the Christian community and there's evangelistic endeavors. Those are the two categories, right? And there's obviously some overlap, like if your children are not saved, Right, they're in both of those categories in one sense, um, or other. You know, there might be other people, but there are people that you need to sever ties with, uh, because they're going to push out the affections that you need to have. So keep that in mind, and that takes wisdom, that takes discernment. You're going to want input from other people on, on thinking through that, uh, but keep that in mind. Number four, uh, the thing is, we're kind of moving through this passage, and this is once was we're into, we're still in chapter two, the second part of verse two of chapter seven is this purity of motive that he's kind of highlighting and pointing out. Paul had wronged no one, right? Paul has, in this venture, in what he's talking about here, he is absolutely pure and right in his motives. And we do know, and we'll look at this more significantly next week in, in the next passage, that, that repentance is necessary for the restoration of relationships that have been damaged like this one was with Paul. But Paul did not need to repent of any sin. Paul had not sinned against the, the Corinthians. It was actually really the opposite. They had wronged him. And, and when we think about this, and we think about how we interact with other people, motive matters. You cannot be manipulative in your relationships. And this takes a great deal of honesty, even with yourself. Don't pursue a relationship because of what you're going to get from the person. Don't think, well, if I hang out with so-and-so, that, that will benefit me. You know, like I, I, have, I have a friend who, um, he has a policy that whenever he goes to lunch with a pastor, any pastor, he pays for lunch. He will not let them pay. And I've had lunch with him many times, and I have to make sure to not think, hey, I'm going to call him to go to lunch because I want a free lunch this week. That can't be my motive, right? And I've given up fighting because it's, it's, a, it's a losing endeavor. But we cannot pursue relationships because of some benefit we may receive from it. I'll re now, you will receive, right? When you're pursuing a relationship, you're going to get something out of that, and that's okay. But you don't do it for the, the perceived relationship. You can't pursue it for that relationship. The motives that you have in these pursuits do matter. And, and Paul had motives in all of this. And all of his motives in relation to the Corinthians here, all of the letters, the visits, the harsh correction, this other letter that we, that we don't have, the motives were all for their good. There were no behind-the-scenes hidden motives like, okay, I'm doing this, but really what I'm wanting is, is this over here. That didn't exist. It's all purity of motives, and we need to pursue that in our own pursuit of relationships as well. Which brings us to the next one, number five, humility. And we'll just say it, right? There is no place for selfishness in the body of Christ. And we know this. You don't have to, you don't have to visit any church more than once or twice probably to hear Philippians 2 quoted, right? Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, which is what we all do instinctively, but for the interests of others. Have this way of thinking, this humility of mind, this other people being more important in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Of course, James, 1 and, uh, James 4 and 1 Peter 5 tell us that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the necessity of humility in the life of a believer cannot be overstated. Psalm 138, Yahweh is high, yet He sees the lowly, but the one who exalts himself, He knows from afar. When you are arrogant and acting in an arrogant or prideful way, you're distancing yourself from God and you're distancing yourself from your brothers and sisters in Christ in a way that you shouldn't. Proverbs 3, he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the humble. 
Proverbs 29, a man's lofty pride will bring him low, but a lowly spirit will take hold of glory. And of course, Jesus, whose words are not more inspired than anybody else, but they're important. Jesus himself said, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So when we're speaking of love and we're speaking of community and we're thinking of how we interact with others in the body of Christ, humility has to be a significant factor. The love of Jesus is the ultimate example of that. Jesus had an other's first humility. Even I mean, he, he was in the throne room of heaven and he left that to walk in the dirt and be scoffed and scorned at the whole time by people that he literally created. And so love... Genuine love and humility cannot exist except together. If there's no humility, there's no genuine agape love. If there's no genuine agape love, there's not going to be humility. It's just that's why pride and scoffing and all of those are so consistently vilified in Proverbs. When you look at the, the man who does not fear God, when you look at the fool, when you look at the scoffer, all of those words are, are laid out. And as descriptions of people who do not know God because they're, they're different. And the gospel is the ultimate picture of humility, right? That's what Christ showed us. That's why he came and died on the cross. There never was a more humble act and never will be a more humble act. That's why we're to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, isn't that crazy? The joy set before him endured the cross. The cross was joy despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary, fainting in heart. His humility should just capture us and, and, and cause us to want to pursue that in our own lives. Of course, Jesus also showed us on the cross number six uh, here in verse three, in the first part of verse three, when he says, I do not speak to condemn you. This is forgiveness. Paul had so much to condemn the church, at, the church in Corinth for. But he refused to give up on them. None of this was an attack on them. He's not coming in and saying, you guys are guilty, 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 and, and pronouncing this verdict. No, his desire was to restore the broken relationship that it had. He's not trying to sever it and distance himself from it. There's no cut and run going on with him. He loved them. He cared for them. His goal was to restore this broken relationship. And again, we'll see the foundation for that next week as we continue in through the passage. But remember how love is described back in 1 Corinthians 13? Now, we always think of that, the 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage, as this like perfect, this wedding passage. We read it at weddings. And it's, it's great. It certainly applies in the context of marriage. But the bigger picture tells us that for a relationship to work, any relationship, especially our relationships with one another in the church, there must be a built-in forgiveness factor. Because the closer you get to someone, the more opportunity you're going to have to sin against them. And the more opportunity you have to sin against them, the more likely you are to sin against them. And the more that forgiveness needs to become a foregone conclusion in the relationship. You know, like, for example, I, I know that my wife is going to forgive me when I sin against her. She's the person I am most likely to sin against of all the people because I live in closer proximity to her than anyone else. I, but that doesn't mean that I have the freedom to just whatever and not worry about it and just sin with reckless abandon because she has to forgive me, right? No, we cannot have that attitude. What this should do is when we realize this, is this should give us an increasing desire to not sin against them. We should be growing not only in readiness to forgive other people when they sin against us, but we should be growing in our desire to not do that. And remember, what has to pervade all of this is love does not take into account a wrong suffered. So let me just tell you right now, if, if, you, if you stay here, which we all, of course, all hopefully you do, but if you stay here as part of this church, somebody in this church will sin against you eventually. Hopefully not next week and hopefully not all the time, but it will happen. So you need to be ready to forgive them. And then that, of course, all of these move right one, in, one into the other. Then we come to this idea of loyalty in verse 3 where he says, I have said before that uh, you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. This is a really cool picture. This is a to the death 
uh, dynamic. The loyalty is written all over this. It's a relationship that, man, we are in it for the long haul. We're so committed to, to one another that we will die together if that's what it takes. It's like soldiers going into battle. Today is a good day to die. It's, 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 Paul is saying, that's how committed I am to this relationship. But he's really taking it even a step farther. He, he's, he's bringing the reality of what the Christian life is into this whole live together, die together by reversing the order, right? Because we say, well, we're going to live and we'll die together. But he says, die together and to live together. So he's reversed the order. And the reason he did is because the reality of the Christian life is, yes, we're going to live together forever, right? That eternality of our relationship. If we're believers, our relationship is literally eternal, and so you're going to be, you know, I, I heard somebody say one time, and I thought it was kind of funny. They said, I hope you like me now, because if you don't like me now, the first 10,000 years in heaven are going to be miserable, because I'll be right there too, uh, I mean, which is kind of funny and kind of silly. But that's what Paul is saying is, he's saying, yes, we, we live together and die together, but we die together so that we can live together. There's this loyalty, but because as believers, our lives are permanently, eternally intertwined. So this full-on commitment is great, but it is great because of where we're going, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing. You're in our hearts to die and to live together. There's this deep affection. He's describing a deep affection that's like roots that go so deep it can't be upended. It's like, you know, you see these trees. We saw them just a few weeks ago, the trees that are falling over. Well, the roots are very shallow. Those are the trees that are knocking over. The deeper the roots go, the less likely that tree is to fall over. It's like a weed, right? You know, you have to pull a weed up by the roots or it's going to grow back. If you just cut it off, what's it going to do? It's going to grow back because the root is there. He's saying that this is you, your love for one another roots you in this community, which also includes, and this is the next thing, Number four, this is in verse four, the first part of verse four, trust. And really, this one makes the least sense. Why on earth would Paul have any trust for the people of the church at Corinth? They're so messed up. It seems like what the church at Corinth is best at is being messed up. And, 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 and wonky and, and weird and bringing in pagan practices and, and all this kind of stuff. How in the world could Paul trust people who had done so many weird, wrong, sinful things who seemed to be so off and had done the things to him that they had done? Well, he's saying, I have great boldness toward them, meaning he has great confidence in who they are. It's because of Christ. This is a baseline confidence he has in them as believers that they are ultimately going to do what's right. He's not saying they're perfect. Certainly nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. The Corinthians aren't perfect. But Paul has a distinct trust that in spite of their imperfectness, he's, in spite of the record, man, they're going to do right. I am going to be intentional, he says, to believe the best about you and to trust you to do the right thing. Again, not saying that you're ever going to do the, never going to do the wrong thing, but I'm going to trust you to do the right thing. And, and this is sort of an in spite of. I've heard this saying before that the best indicator of what somebody's going to do in the future is to look at what they've done in the past. And there's truth in that. We've seen that. If you look at the pattern of someone's life, you can certainly predict probably what they're going to do. But it's also true that we need to think the best of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to, to give them grace and, and, and trust them. And every single one of you here in this room are going to make wrong decisions at some point in the future. You're going to make a bad call. Hopefully it's minor, but it's going to happen. That's just true. Our goal is to minimize that, obviously. And I certainly hope that my, and here's the other thing. I hope that my mistakes, both past, present, and future, are not the grid and the framework that people use to look at me and to evaluate me and think at me through those things. So we need to not think of, about other people through the framework of their past mistakes. Yes, I've sinned. I've sinned. I've, I've sins of commission and sins of omission. Both of those have happened, but that's not what defines us, and we can't let that be how we view and interact with. And if we're to pursue and achieve joy in community, we cannot be looking at past mistakes. We have to be determined to extend trust to people that we're in community with. And then he moves right on into praise. That's number nine. In spite of their many flaws, in spite of their obvious shortcomings. 
Paul loved the Corinthians and he boasted about them. He spoke fondly and affectionately of them. He spoke positively about them and it brought him great joy. He wasn't just writing nice things and some corrective things and saying, I really kind of like you guys and then walking over and saying, oh, but you know what that church is really like? You know what they really did? Do you know who they're following? Do you know what they're... No, he's boasting. He's bragging. He's excited to tell other people about how wonderful they are. And that, that's that final point that we're moving. This That's the joy that's described here in, chap, in verse 4 of chapter 7. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. How beautiful is that? The Corinthians, who had done so many bad things, they are a source of deep, abiding, genuine joy for Paul. He doesn't, again, his love for Christ overflows in a love for them. And it's not that he's just letting things slide as he thinks about them, the, the church. He's thinking about the individuals in the church, the relationships that he has. He's thinking about what he's seen God do in this person and, and how he's seen God working through that person. That brings him a deep abiding joy and he longs to talk about it. And so the bottom line of all this is that we simply have to be a people who are actively, intentionally, consistently purposefully pursuing joy in community. And it's sort of this both and. We, we pursue it so we have it, and we have it, which gives us a greater desire to pursue it. It's a snowball effect. And, and so these ten points, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to briefly go back through the ten points, and I'm gonna, I want to point out some very specific intentional things that we can be doing. Those are sort of the principles of what Paul was doing. But if we go back through these, I want to give you some suggestions in each one of them. And I am fully convinced that if we and as we pursue these ten things, as we pursue them and practice them, it will dramatically increase both our personal joy and our collective corporate joy. And let me just say, if you're not feeling joyful in, in, your, in, your, in the community here, Double down on these ten things, and it will certainly move things in that direction. It begins with honesty, of course. We're back to number one. We have to have an openness and an honesty with one another. You know, and and it ha it's a comprehensive thing, you know, not just in one category or another. You can't be honest about this and then kind of deceptive or deceitful in this. Primarily, it's about God and sin. Uh, when you see sin in someone else's life, whether it's big or even a little thing, uh, you, 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 have, you need to point it out. Now, you need to be gentle in that, and you need to be appropriate in that, but, but do correct where it needs. And we all need correction from time to time. The flip side of this, too, is that you need to be ready to hear and receive the correction. Don't, you, you need to be determined now not to be offended when someone points out a, or comes to you with a concern. Don't get mad and shut them out. Don't restrain your heart from them because they've pointed out. Don't be so committed to you being right that you're not willing to consider that someone else might be right about one of your sins or one of your flaws or some tendency that you have that, that, that you're not aware of for some reason. And that needs to be a regular part of the ebb and flow of our interactions with one another. We were uh, just months, maybe a couple years ago, um, I was in a meeting and, and Todd, who you all know, Todd, my mentor, we are in a meeting and we're kind of talking and having a discussion about something. And he's sitting next to me. And, uh, and he reaches over at one point. And he puts his hand on my arm. And he says, Rob, stop interrupting. And I was like, oh. I realized in that moment, I, this whole two-hour meeting, I've been like just interrupting left and right. He, he, he's like, you're right. And then so then he, we went back to what we were doing. Now, I'm not fully over that. <laughs> I'm sure I've interrupted most of you. But I'm much more aware of it now, and I'm thankful that he pointed that out because that puts it on my radar. We need to be doing that. I wasn't offended by that. And you know what? He was right, and we need that in our lives. It needs to be done in the right setting. It needs to be done with the right motive, and it, there must be love behind it. If you don't genuinely love and care for someone, don't correct them because you're not doing it from the right motive. If you're mad at somebody about something, that is not the time to come in and correct them. But we have to be willing to do that. We have to be honest and open with each other about those things. That's the first thing. Number two, honesty includes affection. That's where Paul goes next. Simply put, you have to love the people in this room and, and the people that are part of us that aren't here right now. You need to tell people regularly that you love them. Appropriately, obviously, right? But, but men, it's okay to say to one another, I love you. You, you need to do that. 
You don't have to do it every time you see somebody. Don't, you don't have to be like, okay, who have I not said I love you to this morning? And stand at the door and make sure you say I love you to everybody. That's not what I'm saying. But people here need to know that you love them. And they need to hear that on a pretty regular, consistent basis, right? Um, how many of you who are married uh, have, have decided that, well, when we got married, on the day of our wedding, I told her I loved her, or I told him I loved him, and, I, you know, that's just going to be reality. If it changes, I'll let you know. That's not okay. No, we all know that's not okay. You need to say, so our kids, I, I tell them I love them. I've told them more than once, right? It's not something that you just happen. But it should also be obvious, right? We need to communicate it. It should be obvious. Again, it doesn't have to be every person every Sunday. But are you, and here's the question for our self-evaluation, are you absolutely sure that the people, the other people here in our church know that you have a genuine, godly affection for them? Do they know? Are you, are you confident that they know? And, and even if you're confident, you need to say it from time to time. You need to pursue actions that demonstrate it. If you know of a need that someone has, how can you address that? If you know of a, of a burden that someone has, how can you ease that? Those are things that you can do. What can you do to encourage someone today before you leave, right? As soon as we're done and, and, and Alex dismisses us with our benediction, it doesn't mean I make a beeline for the door and I'm out of here. I'm not saying you have to stay for an hour and a half. But how, how, what are you doing to demonstrate and communicate love? My goal, one of my personal goals, I hope that every single person who comes here to our church every Sunday before they leave, they know that they're loved. They know that the people here love them. And, and they say, I can't do that by myself. I, I, I'm not going to be able to get around and talk to every single person every week. I wish I could. Maybe some days I will. But, it, but it, if, if it's just up to me to do that, it's not going to happen. It's up to all of us, and it's on all of us. If we're all committed to making sure people know that they're loved, then when everybody leaves, they're going to know that. We all go home knowing we're loved, and that's, part of, that's something that should happen as part of the joy and community. Number three is fellowship, uh, which, and fellowship takes time. But I'm not saying it takes days and weeks and months and years. I'm saying you have to give your time. You have to commit actual time to this. You have to devote time to interacting with others regularly and consistently and lovingly. You know, you've, we, you've heard this, this have people over for dinner. It doesn't mean just that. That's just one of the easy things. I mean, everybody here eats at least once a day. You can invite somebody over to eat. With, and, and it doesn't have to be a five-hour ordeal for those who are less inclined toward Social life, I don't know, what the introverts, the extroverts, whatever. Um, but again, it's just like, hey, we're having dinner tomorrow at, at 6.30. Come over, eat dinner with us, and we have things to do, you have things to do. We'll talk for about 15 minutes after dinner, and then you can be on your way. It's okay to set it up that way, you know, or just go have lunch with somebody. Hey, I have, I have from noon to one. I have to leave at one. Okay, boom. But, but we need to be intentional to, 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 to spend time together. And it is worth the time that you take out of your schedule to get together with other people. Sunday morning, of course, is our most important time together. Discipleship, uh, you know, family groups. I can't overemphasize the importance of family groups. So be on that when they resume in August. But we need relational time with each other outside of the formal structure of the church. And when you give someone your time, you are giving them your most valuable asset because time is something that you can't buy more of and that once it's gone, it's gone forever. So giving someone an hour of your time at some point during the week is an extremely valuable thing and it's an expression of your love for them. So give it away. Number four, purity. Of course, the goal here is that we don't sin against one another. It'll never be perfectly carried out, but it's reasonable to pursue that. Like, for example, do you have in your house a policy that, well, the kids can misbehave seven times before I, call, before I put a stop to them? No. Husbands, do you, do you have a, an agreement with your wife that, that you can treat her with coldness and disdain three times a week without, uh, without repercussions? That sounds ridiculous to say that. So when we're thinking about our interactions with one another, you can't, you, you, our goal is, is to not offend or sin against someone ever. Now we know that it, we can't do that perfectly, but that's the goal. And the flip side of that 
is decide now, just right now, before we, before we move to number five on my list here, decide now, I am not going to be offended by something somebody says or does. Just don't be. Now, if it's offensive, you can talk to them about it, but just decide not to be offended. If you're harder to offend, that's just better for all of us. And it's not that I'm trying. I used to tell people I'm hard to offend, but that's not a challenge. <laughs> you know, but, but again, we, that's just part of that whole idea of purity. Be determined to not sin against someone other, but also not to be easily offended. Number five, humility. It has to be a part of this. Without the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we will not have the humility. But without humility, none of this is possible. And here's where it gets real, okay? In every aspect of what we do as a church, from the time you walk in the door on Sunday morning to discipleship to family groups to whatever we do, in every aspect, you will have a preference for how that should happen. For, for this, that, or the other. And it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's not askew to have a preference, to prefer things to be done this way or happen this way. But the ultimate thing is, is whose preference are you advocating for? We all have a preference, and that's fine. But it can't be about your preference. You have to consider and prioritize the preferences of others. Those are the ones that you need to be advocating for. It's like the, the little cartoon characters, Chip and Dale, right? You remember Chip and Dale? No, I'm sorry, you first. No, no, you first. No, no, you, I insist you first. No, I insist you. That's how we need to be, is preferring one another. And it requires humility. And it requires great humility to even admit that to yourself, that, ooh, I'm pursuing my preference here. How would you be edified by that? Of course, forgiveness again. Forgiveness has to be a foregone conclusion. None of these are new, right? And, and rem remember... Don't ever forget, forgiveness is wired in to salvation at the deepest level. Theologically, your requirement to forgive is woven into your salvation all the way back to your election. The doctrine of election requires forgiveness of others. Colossians 3, as the elect of God, meaning because God chose you, holy and beloved, you have to be compassionate, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. And then he goes on. The longest description in there is because of God's choice of you, bear with one another, graciously forgive one another. When you have a complaint against anyone, as the Lord forgave you, so also you forgive. It really is. It's, this is how simple it is. Forgiven people forgive people. End of discussion. Moving on. Number seven, loyalty. Of course, these are all, again, interwoven. They're all part of one another. They're not disconnected ideas that just happen to be sitting on the, the shelf next to each other. Affection, fellowship are directed, lead into, and flow out of loyalty. This I'm not walking away dynamic. And we understand loyalty, right? Loyalty to a spouse. Loyalty to our siblings. Loyalty to our parents, even when they get in their older age, I'm going to take care of you, those kinds of things. We have loyalty to our friends, like, you know, this guy's been my friend through thick and thin, that kind of thing. Well, that needs to extend to our church family, too. We don't walk away from things just because it got a little weird. Trust. We have to trust one another. And this is something that you do hundreds of times a day. You didn't even think about it. When you walked into this room, you sat down on the chair you're sitting on without considering whether or not the chair uh, was structurally sound enough to support you. You didn't even think, is there a chance this chair might be wobbly? You didn't even think about, is there some kind of, did somebody spill coffee on here that I'm going to sit on and now I'm going to get a stain? Because That wasn't even a, a thought in your mind. You just trusted that that chair was clean and sound and you sat down on it. When you get in the car with somebody else driving, like I, got, I, I was, had a friend in from out of town yesterday and, and I got in the car to go with him somewhere. I've never ridden with this guy before. I've never seen him drive before. I know nothing about his driving ability. I didn't even think, are we going to get there safe or is he going to run us off a cliff? You inherently trust things all the time. When you go out to eat, you trust that the food is not going to make you sick. You trust that they wash their hands before they prepare your food. I guess they do. I don't know. I trust that they did. Those are things. So we need to have that kind of instinctual, automatic trust toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you share deep concerns of your heart with people knowing 
trusting that that's, that that's going to stay where it needs to stay, whether it be a prayer request, confessing sin. I mean, that requires trust. To confess a sin to someone requires that you trust that they're not going to walk away from you and reject you because of what you just told them, or that they're somehow going to start thinking differently about you. It's personal. It's, it's vulnerable. And when you are truly trusting someone, you're also giving them the opportunity to hurt you. And you're doing it not worrying that that's going to happen. You're trusting that it won't. It's like giving someone a key to your house. If I give someone a key to my house, they could go in anytime and rifle through my things. I'm trusting that that's not going to happen, right? And then number nine, this is where it starts to get really good, right? Praise. When was the last time you bragged on somebody here in our church or bragged on our church to somebody outside? And, and, bra- and this bragging, this boasting can be either... Uh, when they're not there or when they're there, right? That's called encouragement. You can brag behind their back. You can, that's called praise. You can say something to them. Make it a habit to talk about the, what people are doing. Uh, like, like, where's Abel? Is Abel in here or is he doing child care? Is he in nursery? Okay, he's not here, so I'll talk about him behind his back. <laughs> I love it. Abel constantly texts me. Uh, and say, hey, pray for so-and-so at work because I, I was able to share the gospel with them. Pray that the Lord uses that in their life. I get that from him all the time. It's so exciting to hear that. And I love to brag on that. All the other people, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things going on, all things, things that we can brag about. And that will not only paint a great picture of who we are to others, but it will lead into joy for all of us because you should literally delight in our community Do things that will bring joy to other people. And when we do that, it brings joy to us. When you brag on one person to another person, whether they're there or not, that's going to bring joy to you. You're not doing it for your own personal joy. You're doing it to boast in them and of them and about them. But it will bring you joy. And everyone that hears it, it will bring them joy too. I guess you could call it positive gossip, but I don't know if that really exists. It's it's boasting. It's, It's all joy. And try that. Think right now of two or three things, uh, either about our church or about individuals, that you can be ready to share. Something that you love about someone here, that you love about our church, and and plan it in your mind and be ready to share. And let me tell you, as you are sharing that, it will bring you joy. It will bring you deeper joy. You know, the, the two people that stay almost every week and clean up after this, that's joyful to see you guys doing that, serving faithfully. Emptying the trash cans. That's, that's, that's so ex- cool to see. I, I, I love it. You know, and I didn't even ask you to do that. You just, you're just doing it. I don't even know how that happened. It's cool. And we, so we brag about each other. And all of these things are part of that second purpose of the church, the edification of the body. Ultimately, however, joy is a product of the gospel. All of this is connected to and flows out of our salvation. Because joy is is a deeper, more abiding thing than mere happiness. It's not a superficial emotion produced by pleasures or comfort. Because we're all comfort seekers. I mean, there's a reason we got nice, comfortable chairs instead of, you know, just sit on the floor, right? We're comfort seekers. We're we're pleasure seekers. That's why you have a favorite restaurant. And and that's why when you go to the, the same restaurant, most often, if you're like me, you, pick, you get the same thing most of the time because I know that's, that brings me pleasure. I like the taste of that particular meal. We all have a favorite season because, it's more com- because we like it. It's comfortable. We all want to spend time with certain people because we're at ease and we're comfortable in their presence. And that's fine. That's all good. But ultimately, when we're talking about joy, it is not a product of comfort or pleasure that, that we have achieved. It's a product of, a product of salvation. And it just gets better in spite of any discomfort that we have. You're a child of God. If you've trusted in Christ, all of your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. In spite of your utter sinfulness, your total unworthiness, your overwhelming selfishness, your inability to do anything to please God on your own, Jesus came and died for your sins. He died on the cross to bring true Deep, lasting forgiveness. Whatever the most vile, disgusting, nasty thing that you've ever done is, that one sin you hope never, you don't even want to think about it. Jesus came and died to forgive that sin. And you don't have to think about it because it's been forgiven. It's gone. It's erased. God looks at you as if you had never done any of that. That is where ultimate joy comes from. 
And when you place your faith in Christ and when you trust in Him alone, that joy can be yours. And then He places you in a community of other people who have that joy, that common unity, that common joy. And when we pursue that together, it's just this explosion. It just comes up more than, it's like what, like the Richter scale, right? The two is twice as good as one. It's just like keeps going up and getting bigger and bigger and better and better. The foundation and source of real joy is what Jesus did on the cross. Because in that is your only hope. And if you have never repented of your sins, do that today. That's the call today. Repent of your sins. Believe in Jesus. Trust in, rely on, cling to what He did on the cross. That is the foundation of joy. That is how you will be. I mean, you can be happy. You can be comfortable. You can feed your pleasures. But you're never really going to have joy outside of Christ. That's the starting point of all of this. The eternal life that is offered freely to all who trust in Him. And it is so awesome that Jesus not only died so that we could have that, that deep joy, but He also uh, puts us into a relationship with Him and into a, in a community that fosters and catalyzes and increased it. So, so participate in these, three, these ten things. That's what, that's what the Christian life is about. Pursuing these things. And, and these ten things are both how we get to joy and community, and they are also a result of uh, what we're doing. And I'm going to put this list, just these ten things, I'll put them up on the blog. You can get to it from the app or just go directly to the website. Just a simple list. Be intentional to look at that list and think about it. And think about how you're doing these things and how you can better engage in these things. How they can be faithful, consistent, ongoing pursuits in your life. And that will serve as the foundation for an even deeper joy that we can have together. That Christ wants us to have. That Christ died so that we could have. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for what you did for us. We, we thank you for the forgiveness that comes, the forgiveness that you gave us. We thank you for the love that you literally poured out on us. We thank you for the community that you have given us. We thank you for, for the, the ability to, to pursue these things, for the capacity to both give and receive all of the things on this list. Help us to have a deeper commitment to these things so that our joy increases, but more so, so that their joy increases. Give us a, a humility that is more interested in the other person than ourself. And let that be the foundation of their joy, which will become our joy as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.